Okay, welcome to the University of Texas at Austin, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Henson, I'm the director of the Texas Politics Project, and I'm happy to be here with uh, four of the uh, leading journalists in the Texas Political Press Corps to talk about the 2016 election. So, uh, immediately to my, uh, to my left is David Rauf. Next to him, Lauren Magahi. Next to her, Ross Ramsey. Next to him, it was a little tricky, Next to him, Jonathan Tylov. So uh, I want to jump right into it, uh, y'all. Um, and we'll start at the top by talking about the presidential results. So let's start by talking about um, how Ted Cruz comes out of this. And I want to start with Jonathan Tylov because he's been on the road with Ted Cruz uh, off and on, not constantly, but off and on during the primary season. So based on what you've seen, Jonathan, where's the Cruz campaign given how Texas went for them? Well, <clears throat> Texas essentially saved him from a near-death experience. So I was with him for like about 20 days in Iowa, and things were going great until uh, one day Trump said that, you know, he's from Canada and he's not eligible. And you saw the power of Trump to just totally discombobulate a campaign just by something he said. Cruz hung on there and did well, but then uh, disappointed, you know, had a disappointing showing in uh, South Carolina and then Nevada, and I think at that point, he came back here and he was pretty much a wreck. I mean, it looked like he could be out of it. And then Texas revived him, and he's now, you know, not all that far behind in the delegate count because of Texas. He won Oklahoma and Alaska. And, you know, Mitt Romney now says that Ted Cruz is on the legitimate list. He's on the, he's on the right side of being uh, acceptable. And that's something that I don't think uh, Mitt Romney or Ted Cruz would have imagined a couple weeks ago. Was it, you, you say they were really on the skids, their poll numbers dropped a little bit. Was it evident from oh, yeah. what you could see in terms of the campaign folks that they were yeah. I mean, feeling they, the heat? South Carolina, they thought like as the polls were closing that they were gonna finish second. So they were, they were clearly off. And you had, you know, Dan Patrick there who's running the campaign, you know, here in Texas, but he was in South Carolina saying, well, it's now a two man race. And it was, it was a nonsensical assertion at the time because which two people are you talking about? Um, and, you know, I, I, um, I was driving in the middle of the night to, I guess, Houston um, for his return to Houston uh, after Nevada. And the, the whole cycle of uh, commentary on CNN and MSNBC was he's dead, he's done. He, he lost the evangelical vote. He's headed to a Super Tuesday where he was supposed to be the king of the, you know, the king of the mountain and he's going to be humiliated. He'll be lucky to hang on to Texas. And, you know, things get, the pendulum swings, but things get exaggerated. He was kind of sick and a little bit tired, at, at, you know, at, by the end of Nevada. And I think, uh, you know, it, it just, it revived him coming home. It actually made a difference that Greg Abbott endorsed him, even though that seems kind of pro forma. It just was a way of saying, no, everything's okay. We're gonna, you know, you're, you're back home. This is a big state and you're gonna come out of Super Tuesday, not where you thought you'd be, but in good enough shape to proceed. There's a part of that that's really, I mean, I think pre-Trump and post-Trump expectations. I mean, we were talking about that the other day at the Tribcast, Ross. I mean, do you think he was ever, there was ever slippage here? Or do you think that was really all expectations? That and, Trump slipped or that Cruz No, that Cruz, did, did Cruz really slip here ever? I, I think he did a little bit. I think, you know, the questions out of New Hampshire and out of South Carolina were, wait a minute, he didn't have the votes that we thought he had. He was supposed to be building a coalition of evangelicals, whatever exactly that means, of libertarians and, you know, to some extent, the middle finger vote, right? And, and Trump stole the middle finger vote and stole a fair number of the people who go to church more than a couple of times a week. And I think after everybody saw the result in South Carolina, they wondered about the polling in places like Texas that showed him strong with some of those groups. It's like, well, maybe that's a little bit thinner membrane than we thought it was. Donald Trump starts talking like that and you feel like you can say, the middle finger vote on the campus with a bunch of students in the room? I think I can. Is that what I'm hearing? I, yeah. No hand, no hand size kid, jokes? These kids, no hand size jokes especially. These kids have never heard any language like well, that, even remotely, so it sort of goes back, it goes Look back at them, they're scandalized. It goes to what Jonathan was saying. You know, Cruz started this thing expecting, and, you know, Romney and everybody else was expecting Cruz to be the exemplar of that, right? This is the guy who's outside, who won't play well with others. And now that we've sort of passed the box of chocolate stand and somebody has to, you know, there's only four left, I guess I'll eat the hazelnut. Um, you've got people like Romney saying, okay, I'll- cruise. You just lost the students again. What the heck? 
that's all right. There's a box of chocolate somewhere. <laughs> I think what's what's so amazing about the whole narrative now, right, is that, right, it's we had Lindsey Graham last week saying if someone murdered Ted Cruz on the floor of the Senate and the Senate were the arbiters of that murder trial, no one could convict the murderer because right. that's how hated he is. But now you have Paul Ryan saying maybe we're, you know, maybe Cruz is our guy because Trump is so unpalatable. So, I mean, the the narrative now is they waited far too long. Right party waited too long. They put too much stock in people not voting for Trump. And now he's far enough ahead where, you know, their options are convince one of the the Cruz or, or Rubio to, to become the, the standard bearer and the other guy drop out or split the vote so much that we have some kind of a brokered convention. I mean, rock in a hard right. place, right? So Well, and I think, you know, this, that scenario is a very odd one, I think, still. And there's already a lot of latest wave positioning on what a brokered convention would look like and how you even define it, what our expectations should be. I heard Marco Rubio on NPR this morning saying, well, you know, a brokered convention where nobody's actually competed would clearly be wrong, right? So, but one, one of the assets that Cruz is going to have is that he, he, ha he is the last man standing in Texas and in the fundraising pool, right? And David, you've been, you've been following campaign finance a bit and Cruz now it looks like is going to inherit at least some of that Texas money, right? It looks like that's already started happening. If I'm not mistaken, I think some of the Jeb Bush financiers have already made his way over to the Ted Cruz team. And the money game is going to be a big deal to look at moving forward. Ted Cruz uh, had dominated a lot of the big, big money from the Wilkes brothers and, and some other money. And moving forward... Explain, explain that to the Wilkes brothers. Are so you've got a West Texas family, uh, conservative, highly religious family out there that pumped a total of $15 million into a Ted Cruz super PAC six, seven months ago. Biggest single drop of money, I think, in the election cycle so far. And that's mostly been because you had these uh, sort of mega daddy war bucks like Sheldon Adelson stay clear of the fray so far. But it will be interesting to see sort of how this money divide pans out moving forward. And I don't know that the Mitt Romney getting behind Ted Cruz helps him so much. Is, is the idea here now that Ted Cruz, Mr. Anti-Establishment, is the establishment or the best the establishment can do to battle Trump? I, I, I don't think that he's supporting him. It's just he's, he's, he's on the okay list. So. But does that help? Does it, does it help to have a failed presidential candidate get behind you and start shooting arrows at I, the guy? I think it helps because, you know, someone, another failed presidential candidate, Bob Dole, had said he'd prefer Trump to Cruz. So there was, there was a certain sentiment a few weeks ago that all things being equal, you know, Trump will make deals, Trump's adjustable, Trump's everything that Cruz says about Trump as a negative, they see as a positive, which is that he's just about, you know, accommodating and, and, and getting along. And he's a, he's a people person. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I think the transition of moving some of this quote unquote establishment action over to, over to, over to Cruz is very complicated, particularly since we're also seeing a more structural dynamic in which you've got all kinds of people, you know, candidates lower on the ballot in the States actually throwing in with Trump simply to save their skin, right? And we've seen that moving forward already. Um, somehow, I think we'll come back to this, but I feel like we have to talk about the Democrats a little bit. Now, when you, uh, when you got moved, when you changed jobs, Lauren, you got dropped kind of into the presidential level, but very much at the, on the Democratic side. So how did that look, look to you um, from the ground and from your coverage? Could, certainly Hillary Clinton did way better than everybody thought, certainly better than we thought she was going to do or what we had gotten in polling a few weeks out, but she outstripped everything. Yeah. Did, did you feel like that was evident? We talked about oh, yeah. that story. Oh, yeah. I, think. I mean, Hillary Clinton, she's been around forever, right? But you really felt it when you were dealing with the campaigns. Um, her campaign apparatus in Texas, I mean, everywhere, but in Texas is so strong. I mean, they're calling you all the time. There's five press releases going out about this endorsement. You know, this event, Bill's coming to Laredo, Bill's going to Paul Queen College. I mean, all over the place. And, you know, Sanders, will, he brought out huge, I mean, some of you guys probably went to the rally here in Austin. He was bringing out 10,000 people, but it was hard to get his campaign on the phone. And when you're talking to them about strategy, you know, he had, the way that Bernie Sanders could have picked off delegates here is if he... He concentrated on areas like Austin, other college towns where the young vote would really turn out if he could convince them to vote. Um, and he, he, you know, his, his campaign said that that wasn't what, what their strategy was. They were just trying to retail politics in a state with 
you know, 25 million people. And so it was, it was just, it was palpable when you were dealing with the campaigns that you saw how entrenched and, and long the Clintons have been doing this and how, you know, Bernie was pretty new to this, this game of national politics. I mean, it seems like there was a piece of this that it was hard for the Sanders campaign to scale up as well. And it exposed them to a certain degree uh, in ways that I think everybody kind of anticipated. Were you were you guys surprised by the scale of the win when it started happening? I was surprised that <clears throat> he won some of the groups he won, you know, uh, in, in which the was everybody. Well, but she uh, won in, in the polling we did. You know, he was behind with or uh, he was he was ahead in Anglos. Mm -hmm. And she was ahead with Hispanics and ahead with blacks. And, and you know, when we were talking about the poll before the election, uh, a lot of the conversation was this margin, it's clearly Hillary's race. The margin is going to depend in some measure on Hispanic turnout. And it, you know, it did and it didn't. You know, there were, um, she turned out to win with Anglos. She turned out to win, as you said, with better organization. She did win Travis, or he did win Travis County and he did win Brazos County. So. A and M and UT went Bernie, um, but he won Travis County anyway. barely. He went well, barely counts. Right. Yeah, um, and he did okay, you know, in delegates in Texas, uh, but it wasn't the kind of win. This was the kind of place where you needed to, if you're in Bernie Sanders' campaign, you needed to scare the Hillary people a little bit, and they clearly didn't do that. Do, do you think they had the machine? Did they have the, the set the, the machine? The Bernie Sanders machine have the scale to run a campaign in a state the size of Texas and as expensive as it is in Texas? Would well, be my question. It wasn't just Texas. I mean, it was the part of the problem was you know Texas doesn't scale well for campaigns like that, and part of the problem is that you're running in a dozen states at the same time. Yeah. It's not you know you're running all these other places too. So he had to be looking at this, and I, this happened on the Republican side too. You can quickly get into a math problem here, but the way the delegates were proportioned, you could forfeit a particular state knowing you were going to win more delegates in another state if you spent your time there, say Oklahoma, right. than if you tried to press your case in, in Texas. And I think they made some decisions like that, and you know, for better or for worse. I want to slowly transition a little bit more towards Texas, but I want to stick with the presidential, at least the impact for a little, for a little while. Win or lose, I mean, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to say win or lose, but does this change the view of Cruz in Texas now that we've gone through this, it's happened? I mean, I think going in, we knew Cruz was going to do well. We had seen him win here before, but there is something different about, it seems to me, about winning a presidential campaign here. Does he gain stature no matter what happened, or did he lose stature because Trump did enter the picture in such a way? I think, I think he maintained. I think... He was in danger of, of suffering his first real setback since he's been on the scene. Right. And this was a strong win, and it just was like, no, we, it was, if you look at the results here, he, like, evangelicals, he, he carried them by a large margin here in Texas. So this is what was supposed to be the template for everywhere else. It, it, I think when, when you know, uh, Trump you know, kept calling him a liar and an unstable person and whatever, that had an accumulated impact on people for whom Ted Cruz was not someone they knew. Here, I think there's a sense of, you know, oh, that's, no, we know who Ted Cruz is. We voted for him a couple times. So I think it, it, he wasn't affected in, the, in here, here and in Oklahoma, which is sort of greater Texas, the way he was elsewhere. So, I, I mean, I think he came out well enough so that he's, he's in great shape here, but he was, you know, on the, on the edge there for leading into it. You know, we've seen a lot of the... Texas elected officials around him and very close, certainly within camera range as much as possible. Um, do you think... Uh, Elbowing each other, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a certain amount of shoving going on. Um, I mean, I mean, are we seeing that? Are we, are we going to see more of that, do you think? I mean, that, I guess that's what I'm wondering is, does his interior sort of facing political influence become larger now? For at least 10 years, we've had the same most prominent Republican in Texas. It's been Rick Perry. And now we've sort of got this dot race going on. Is the most prominent Republican name in Texas Cruz or Abbott or Patrick or, you know, arguably the most powerful Republican from Texas is named Cornyn and he's not even in that conversation. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a jump ball right now. How do you think it influences then the kind of internal maneuvering in the legislature? Both of, both of you have covered that a lot in the, you know, in the last year or so, certainly in the last session. Um, it, it's hard for me to not to look at 
Dan Patrick standing shoulder to shoulder with Ted Cruz every chance he gets and see that probably more valuable to, to Patrick than it is to Cruz in the, in the long run. Does that make sense to you in terms of the politics of the legislature? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think you have you know, Dan Patrick aligning himself with the, uh, the Tea Party hero from the state. And I think he'll take that back to the legislature next session to sort of reinforce his stance as the leading Tea Party figure at the legislature itself. Yeah, given um, Abbott's endorsement, I think he's actually going to take a step back now from from the whole thing. I mean, I think we will see Patrick, Dan Patrick, continuing to, to kind of glom on um, because it fits his narrative a lot better than it does Abbott's. I think Abbott is like, okay, here, you know, I put my check next to this guy and, you know, now I'm, I'm kind of, I'm good for a little while. To sort of like... Uh highlight the the impact Ted Cruz potentially has on folks back home in their own races. Go back to the 2014 cycle uh, in the attorney general race with uh, Dan Branch and Ken Paxton. And Ken Paxton aired a TV ad in which well, Ted Cruz was featured but didn't explicitly endorse him. Paxton wasn't even in the ad. Right. It was, it was, it was an ad for Paxton that featured Cruz and essentially that was what put Ken Paxton over the hump, way over the establishment candidate for Dan Branch. So it was this weird kind of an endorsement, non-endorsement TV ad that really sealed the deal for Ken Paxton two years ago. And that is a good example of the influence Ted Cruz had, I think still has, in circles all throughout the state here. Let's invert that just a little bit before we move more directly to the state stuff. What's the impact on Texas if Donald Trump is the candidate, which I think right now is the Republican nominee for president, which I think right now, if you're a betting man, that's sort of what you should bet on. You know, there's no connection in a primary ballot between people at the top and people on down. You know, I can't tell whether this House candidate or that House candidate is, you know, associated with Cruz or with Trump or with Rubio or with Kasich or with one of the dead guys. Uh, you know, you just can't tell. And so you make guesses. You may know in November, everybody's connected. It'll say Trump, R, and then down here, right. this candidate will have an R by their name. And they're going to be associated with Trump for better or for worse. Now, on the other side, they're going to be associated with Clinton, for better or for worse. And it may be, you know, everybody's going through the ballot, you know, much as the Republicans are now and looking for the least worst choice. Uh, but they're going to die from association or live by association. Yeah, there'll be some weird power inversions. I mean, Katrina Pearson uh, will go from um, very fringe ca uh, character to, you know, White House press secretary. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Don't. <laughs> don't. <laughs> and this tell, is tell the audience. Who well, Katrina this is Pearson Katrina is Pearson doing. was a Tea Party person in Dallas who ran um, a, a primary challenge to Pete Sessions. She had the. She was very close to Cruz's. Rafael Cruz uh, supported her, so that's Ted's father. That was a very rare thing. And then, uh, you know, I went to the Trump rally in Dallas uh, some months ago, and there she was introducing Donald you were Trump. Working. I was working. Yeah. yeah. It, was a, <laughs> it was a pleasure. Um, I mean, Trump rallies, you know, if you spend like, if you go to like 25 cruise rallies in, in about five days and go to a Trump rally, the Trump rally is just a lot of fun. I mean, it's- So, so it's, long as you're not getting choke slammed in the pen. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. if you stay in the pen, you're fine. <laughs> you know, because I, I wondered about that. I tried to leave the pen and the guy had an earpiece and I said, can I leave? And he said, no. But the thing is, you have a choice whether to go in the pen you don't have to go in the talk pen. About the, tell them about anyway, the pen. Anyway, so well, tell the, pen, them about the, pen. the pen is just, you know, you, you go to a rally and there's a pen where they put reporters. My cat. And so he can point to them and say, those are the most dishonest people in America. And, he does. and then awesome. they'll say, but there, but there was one good story. What was that? Uh, you know, and then he'll talk about the Time magazine story that he really liked. And then I'll say, they never show the audience unless we kick someone out and then they'll pan and you'll see how many people are here. So the problem is that if you, my experience was that you, if you just kind of walk in, you don't have to go in the pen. You can mill with the people. But if you get in the pen, you can't leave the pen. So, and that's what happened apparently. It's a kind of a, existential metaphor. A, a there. photographer who got quite. body slammed by the Secret Service. Um, well, but, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, so Katrina Pearson, anyway, now is on TV as she's a national spokesperson for the Trump campaign. And she says the most horrible things about Ted Cruz now. And it's just an amazing uh, turnaround. And I think there's. You know, um, Morrow, you know, our, the new uh, Republican Party chairman here in Travis County, co-wrote the book with Roger Stone, which will be the template for Trump's attack on Hillary Clinton for Bill Clinton's sex life and for Hillary Clinton's covering up and, and enforcing, you know, um, 
silence upon the women who try to make those claims. So people who are otherwise considered out, way outside may you know, be the ones who Trump stays with when he comes to Texas to visit. I, I what I'm, I think is going to be really interesting if Trump is the nominee and he is the R at the top of the ballot. Um, it's you know, common knowledge you guys wrote about this week. A lot of people have. When you have primary elections, you get a whole bunch of people voting at the top. You know, they're voting for president and and all that, and then they kind of quit. They stop even marking right. boxes. So you see big numbers at the top and not a lot of people voting for, you know. Cr- criminal court of appeals or whatnot. I think it'll be interesting to see whether that flips, um, you know, if there is a sizable number of people that skip that top, if it's a Trump name and, and vote down ballot. I don't, I think that would be rather extraordinary, but It'd I think it, it would be interesting to see whether people actually do skip checking that box. Well, that does, I mean, that does sort of push to the next thing I was going to ask about that, which is, I mean, I was watching election returns at a couple of different places and was talking to, you know, fairly traditional Republican operative in this world who basically said, you know, I I will not vote for Donald Trump. And I'm wondering how many more elite Republicans will have that view. I think think you're hearing it a lot right now, but I don't know if it will last. It's going to be an interesting test of, of party loyalty and the, the meaningful of the party of the meaningfulness of the party label. Well, at the very least, last night one of the last questions posed in that raucous debate was a uh, question on party loyalty, and you had all three of the Trump opponents say that they would, in fact, support Trump if he was on the ticket. Yeah, I don't know why yeah. all three of them said they would do that. To be honest, I mean, I thought at least Rubio. It's the only answer you can give. But I thought you, at least you can't so run for president as a lose? Republican and say you're not going to support right. the winner. I don't know. I, I feel like it, you know. You can't vote one for Michael Bloomberg in that question. I mean, right. because the whole the whole point of that of that loyalty test was to force Trump to say he would support someone else because they thought it was laughable. Yeah. They didn't want him to leave. You can't then apply. You can't then reverse the case and say, "Well, that was only meant to." I think they're eating their words a little bit about it now. I mean, yeah. But well, the, I, I kind of suspect, or I wonder a lot whether they actually thought through that dimension of asking that question. That that question was was clearly meant to put Trump on the spot, but it wound up trapping the rest of the ticket. Right. But do you right. trust it, do you trust Trump to actually adhere to his answer? Of course not. Right. Exactly. <laughs> no, 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 but but Trump's answer was I will do it as long as I'm treated fairly. So which is he, which is he, consistent. He which had is a little asterisk. Yeah, here's right. my here's my yeah. clause. So you know this happened in a much milder way, but it happened in a serious way in nineteen eighty. You know, there were a lot of Republicans who weren't going to vote for that damn actor. And then they finally got to the point where it's like, well I'm not going to vote for Jimmy Carter. And Ronald Reagan won easily. Um, you know, there, there will, there's two races here. And as soon as this race is over, they'll come to whatever candidate they've got. You know, if it's Donald Trump, they'll, you know, they might have to hold their nose for a while. But when it's Trump or Hillary, I think a lot of Republicans are going to go, oh, yeah, it's Hillary. I'm with Trump. Well, Hillary is the contrast, I think, is the key thing. Although, I th- you know, I, I do think the, the Trump-Reagan comparison, I think Trump is still... It's a, he's, he, he's, he's still a, a creature unto himself he's, he's a few in terms notches of what out we've seen. On the spectrum, but. And, and I'd add one thing to this. I mean, you know, what Ross is saying here is that he's going to expect the party to line up behind Trump because he's going to be the party candidate. I expect the money and the donors to do the same exact thing. There's some stories eking out already that some of the big billionaires on the Republican side are going to be more than willing to pump money into Donald Trump if he is indeed the guy. You have the money, you'll have the party support. He'll start to look much more in, like a candidate. Yeah, you're gonna have a cabinet with people named Sessions and Christie. They're gonna be the early rats. And the, and then the, and then that flexible part of him will actually become an asset, right? Which is at least if he can exert enough. I mean, there's a question I think about how much self control he's really exerting here. I want to I want to turn to the state a little bit. Um, you know, I think for all you know, we've talked about all these unusual things that have that have gone on. There was not a lot of unusual results from the state from the elections below the top of the ticket this time. Um, probably the marquee race in terms of consequence was the race in San Antonio, uh, Joe Strauss's uh, re-election race in the Speaker of the House in his congressional district, in his state house district. And you covered that quite a bit. Why don't you start by talking about that, David? Yeah, so, so Joe Strauss is the uh, incumbent out of uh, House District 121 in San Antonio. He's the Texas House Speaker going on to serve his fifth term as speaker, if I'm not mistaken, will tie a record for speakerships in Texas. And it has become the norm now for Joe Strauss to uh, draw a Tea Party challenger and to spend a lot of money fending off not just the challenger, but a variety of groups from all over the state that are particularly venomous at the House Speaker. 
And this time around, it was the most expensive race in that particular district ever, I want to say. The House Speaker spent close to $4 million, $3.7 million, eight days out of the election, so he kept spending through the final week. Uh, they put two Tea Party challengers against him, a complete unknown and a former school teacher named Sheila Bean, and a local Tea Party activist, a guy named Jeff Judson, who had some clout in the local community for being outspoken on some issues. And one can only surmise the idea was to sort of try to catch the wave of fervor, you know, Tea Party fervor, far right fervor that was going to be going through the presidential campaign, angst against the establishment, and try to fracture that district as much as possible and force Joe Strauss into a runoff. And the strategy failed on its face. Joe Strauss ended up clobbering both opponents uh, with almost equivalent numbers as he did when he faced one opponent. He just had to spend a lot more money. It was an extremely ugly race. There were accusations of murder, um, all kinds of stuff going on. And if you lived in that district, you were bombarded with mailers and TV ads. You have a House speaker who spent nearly a million bucks to beat two unknowns, a million dollars on TV ads alone. So it was an ultra expensive race. And at the end of the day, the House Speaker triumphed. And one has to wonder, um, Joe Strauss is about sending signals, I believe, at least to the Tea Party. He uh, was able to capture the speakership with only getting 19 votes against him in 150 chamber last time. Spend a lot of money and you crush your opponent and you come back and say, what are you going to do next time? But it was a fascinating race with a lot of money and a very uh, consistent result from, from the historical perspective. So, Ross, you watch these things internally quite a bit. What are, you, what are you reading into this now that we've had a little more sleep and a couple of days to think about it? You know, the remarkable thing about the election to me was that for all of the noise at the top about, you know, this is an election where we're throwing a brick through a plate glass window, only four incumbents got beat on the whole ballot, on the whole state ballot, uh, which is an extraordinarily small uh, turnover. Only three um, races are going, only three incumbents are going to runoffs. So seven max, that's, you know, that's nothing in, the, in, a, in a turnover in the Texas House. So it tells you that voters are stirred up about what all's going on at the top of the ticket and not all that unhappy with everybody below that. Now, I suspect if there was a thing on the ballot that said incumbent next to people's names, there would be a lot more carnage. But, you know, for the most part, people seem pretty happy with what they've got. They seem, you know, in, in a bunch of these races that we were watching, Strauss is one of them, a lot of people, including Strauss's internal people, thought these races were really, really close. Some of Strauss's people were saying, you know, 48 hours before this thing, this may be a runoff. This is going to be tight. And he got, what, 60% or something like yeah, that. Exactly. A bunch of these races ended up like that. Uh, some of the races that we thought were going to be very, very close turned out to be very, very close. Byron Cook got there with 222 votes to spare. Um, Dan Flynn got there with something like 500 votes to spare. Um, Molly White only got beat by 118 votes. Some of those were close, but you know, a win's a win. It didn't turn over the House. And I'm kind of with David on this. The result of this is kind of an affirmation of what Strauss is doing. He walks out and says, you know, I get the banner, I get the win. The House is the same composition as it was before. Five terms, stuff it. Well, I think going into this, I mean, one of the things that, that's been really interesting to me as We've talked a lot about this dynamic of the insiders versus the outsiders, Strauss versus anti-Strauss, is that the approval levels for the state legislature among Republicans is very high. It's like 60, 70 percent when you ask people whether they're satisfied with the state government, when you ask Republicans about their opinions towards different government entities. They prefer the highest approval ratings go to state government above local and national government. And they're deeply distressed that the federal government, state government in Texas is not catching that kind of, you know, uh, that kind of vinegar, if you will, from Republican voters. Um, so, so how do you, you know, when you look at the speaker's race and you look at this pattern, Josh, or that Josh, that uh, Ross is talking about, Lauren, um, you know, what do you read into it based on, you know, what do you expect to see based on what you saw in the, ha in the chamber last time in both uh, chambers? Well, I think um, it's been said twice, Strauss can claim a win. And I think he's going to continue running the house as he did before. I mean, he forms, he, he ha always has lieutenants. He didn't lose many of them this time. He has lieutenants that get very prominent spe um, uh, chairmanships. And he's very careful about what even is brought before that chamber for discussion? And I think that's, you know, that it 
funnels down into the approval ratings. I mean, when they have discussions over really controversial issues like campus carry or whatever, it's usually because Strauss has allowed it to happen or it somehow got, you know, something went wrong and now they have to talk about it. But but it's it, he very carefully manages that chamber and I think that's why, you know, he has the, this group behind him that's very supportive of him and 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 I think that we're going to see that same thing going forward and on the Senate side I think it's the same as well I mean Dan Patrick will be back and we have some new senators but the party breakdown is going to be the same Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think we're going to see the same you know clashes between a house that is is conservative but is you know less inclined to take up these really uh, divisive Topics and then a Senate that's going to be talking about school vouchers. They're going to be talking about all that kind of sanctuary stuff again. Cities. Sanctuary, sanctuary right. cities. You know everything they can and will talk about um, from from far right perspective. They will be so. I, I'll think, take your I'll take your thought one step further. This this idea that Washington is broken and that the state government in Texas is working to a T has become a marketing spiel to some extent for incumbents. And I say that because when Joe Strauss runs, his mailers say. Washington is broken, but in Texas, we're getting conservative results. And they're able to sort of point back to the dysfunction in Washington, D.C. and say, that's not us. We're a Republican party here in Texas that pushes through on conservative ideals and doesn't have the same sort of uh, gridlock that, that's uh, uh, present in D.C. So I think that, that plays well to them uh, for some extent. I think, I think for reporters, there was a, a big win and a big loss. Uh, Trey Martinez Fisher losing. He's like a very dynamic player and very good to reporters in terms of But on the opposite news. end of this year, Democrat. Uh, right. Yeah. And then, and then uh, the fact that Jonathan Stickland survived is, you know, I mean, in a click-driven uh, news world, uh, he's gold. <laughs> he's absolute gold. You know, one, one... You heard it here. Jonathan Tylov said, Jonathan Stickland is gold. He is. <laughs> Just a footnote to this. You know, for all of the dismay about Congress, I think in our poll, Congress had a 12% approval rating, which I think was an improvement Actually, it was a little bit. Um, no member of Congress in the Texas delegation who didn't voluntarily give up their seat lost. Everybody won. You know, hate it, but I use it. Or I hate it, but I like mine. It's, you know, they were really consistent for incumbents. Sorry, just to piggyback on the, the Trey Martinez-Fisher thing, um, David was talking about this in the hall, where, and he can talk about it more if he wants to, but whoever takes up the mantle of Trey Martinez-Fisher on the Democratic side, Sylvester Turner, also another prominent Democrat, has now gone from the state house. So there's there's kind of a vacuum there for who who's going to lead uh, those individuals in, in that chamber and kind of up for grabs, I guess. I don't know if you have a guess. I don't really have a guess as no, to who's going to. No, I think gonna... if Ross maybe. I think right now there's sort of this gaping hole in terms of who is going to be the big voice for the Democrats on key issues at the back mic. Um, it's been Sylvester consistently on budget issues. It's been Trey tanking anything under the sun possible. And now um, I don't know who steps up and sort of fills the role of shooting the missiles and playing negotiator as well. Trey wasn't just a, uh, you know, sort of the the uh, the bomb dropper back there. He was in with the Strauss leadership team and was able to negotiate things as well. Right, right. And so, I mean, and that is something that happens behind the scenes away from the back mic. And that is gone now. And well, I don't he know kinda, who He kind of yelled shoes. himself into a negotiating position. And, Absolutely. And didn't yeah. have to yell so much after a while. Yeah. Best I mean, friend some, of his. Right. Something that would put into, into perspective for college students is Trey Martinez Fisher and a couple of other Democrats were on the conference committee that came up with the the campus carry version of campus carry that we have now. So when, before it was passed, it did not have a provision that would allow campus presidents to futz with the rules. It was just, you know, this is what it is and you gotta take it. And when they went into that back room, it was Trey Martinez Fisher and a couple of other people that really hammered out this compromise. And so, you know, that that individual is not there anymore, so we're gonna have to see who who takes this. It really is an inflection point in the Democratic leadership. I mean, you know, we went through one when uh, you know there was a you know Garnet Coleman and Jim Dunham and Pete Gallego were sort of the right. Uh, three guys running that. Two of them moved on. Uh, Garnet has moved into other roles in the House. And, you know, you're going to see who else steps up. We've got a generational change. Sylvester Turner's been in the House for ages. Um, Trey Martinez Fisher, you know. Uh, it seemed like he had been there for ages. Well, he was there for a long time. I mean, you get, you know, you still think of him as, you know, the new guy because he's still brash like he was when he was fresh. But um, he'd been there for a while. And, you know, yeah. 
new people will step up or not. And, and if you look back to last session, uh, young, younger young law, lawmakers who stepped up, look at Cesar Blanco, was very articulate in relaying concerns about uh, border spending. Right. And so you wonder if he may be somebody that steps up. But I just don't know who fills the gap. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there, I mean, there's two inter, interrelated questions here. One is, is this an opportunity for the Democrats to you know, provide a little bit of mobility for some of the younger voices that have been kind of waiting and trying to break in. But what are the structural constraints? Because, you know, no matter who you are in the Democratic Party, you're not going to be able to do a lot, right? It's a, it's a pretty fraught career path for most of those guys at this point. I think before we open it up for questions from the audience, um, I want to do a quick round robin. We've kind of recapped where we are. We've looked forward a little bit. What should people be looking for going forward, you know, maybe a quick national story, a quick, a quick state dynamic as we come out of the primary. We've all been waiting for this primary, it seems like, for so long. Uh, now it's behind us. What's next? What, do you, what are you watching? I'm going to start with you, David. Uh, so I do a lot of money and ethics stuff, and, and to be honest with you, I'm waiting for Governor Abbott to roll out his ethics proposals leading into the next legislative session. And I say that because there was a huge collapse, breakdown, loggerhead war between the Senate and the House on the issue of ethics reform. Um, so I will be interested to see how the governor plans to lead in the months uh, coming into the session, what kind of ideas he puts out publicly, and how the House under Joe Strauss reacts, and whether or not they go after this dark money issue again uh, next session. But um, you know, moving forward, since we have all the same pieces in place, I'm interested to see what happens on that particular front. How about you, Lauren? I'm going to be interested in two things. One, obviously, everyone's watching the Republican presidential candidates to see who wins in Ohio and Florida. Um, if, if Trump wins in either of those states, uh, there's going to be, you know, it's going to look a lot more clear than it looks now. Um, in terms of what state lawmakers are doing, uh, just today there's been a, a lot of talk about tuition hikes. Um, as, as you all probably know, UT has, has decided to raise tuition um, across all but one of its institutions, including Austin. And lawmakers are going to be looking in the interim at cost, they're going to be looking at student debt. They're going to looking, be looking at a lot of affordability issues uh, with an eye towards whether or not lawmakers need to be given the control over setting tuition like they had into back in 2003. Personally, I think that that's a very politically fraught idea. Lawmakers gave up that control because they didn't want to have to right. raise tuition. Um, but individuals like Dan Patrick and Democrats, too, are talking about it's it's gotten out of control. Um, we need to we need to revisit whether kids are spending too much on college. So, yeah, I'd say politically the continuing splits in the Republican Party. You know what what's going to happen to that party? And you know we had a two party state for a long time that was Democrats. Now we have a two party state that's Republicans. I'm kind of curious on which side's winning uh, and how the presidential race figures into that. The issue that I'm watching is you know the big boring issue that keeps coming back uh, is school finance. And it's really big. It's really expensive. It's fraught with terrible choices for legislators. They either lower standards, they raise state taxes, or they force your property taxes to go up. So they're all scared to death of it, and the Supreme Court is going to rule here pretty soon on it. Yeah, I, I think uh, Lauren had it right that uh, March 15th with Ohio and Florida is decisive, and it's just an interesting situation because Cruz is in a good spot right now, and he's got sort of the smartest, most able team, but it's things beyond his control. So for the next week or two, it's a matter of marginally trying to keep Trump from accumulating too many delegates and doing well, but really he's got to wait and see what happens to other people. And, um, you know, that's a, a very fraught moment for him. Are you going back out? Oh, I don't know. On the road. You don't know yet. Okay. Uh, let's open it to the floor for questions. Try and keep your questions brief. I don't know if we have a microphone or not. Where's, we do not. Okay. So just a show, of, you know, raise your hand and we'll call on you and try to say who you are and enunciate your question. Uh, Brandon already with the Texas Realtors. Um, have, this is for you, David. Have you any sense of what Empower Texans or the affiliated groups, Homeschool Coalition, all those groups that we sort of associate? Yeah. Do you have any sense for what they spent this, this cycle? So uh, let me sort of give some context here. The, the question is asking... Um, how much these PACs that are aligned with Tea Party candidates spent, and in particular spent trying to uh, take out incumbents in the last cycle. You put the uh, Empower Texans spending somewhere in the range of about 1.4 to 1.5 million. 
I, I think Homeschool Coalition was about 500K. Uh, Northeast Tarrant County Party threw in, some, it was probably about two to $3 million more or less is, is what more or less what was sunk into the house races. Uh, and in overall total, the, one of the most imp interesting figures though is that if you actually break down the donors, it, the money did not come from all that many sources. Exactly, the, the Wilkes brothers, uh, the same West Texas family, uh, billionaire family that gave the Ted Cruz Super PAC $15 million, got very active in the primary cycle for the first time uh, and put about a million dollars into two different PACs, uh, 800K into Empower Texans, 200K, I think, into Homeschool Coalition, and maybe another three or 400K into Texas Right to Life, if I'm not mistaken, but over a million dollars. And so you have a very small set of billionaires on the Tea Party side that are funding a web of groups that then sort of throw that money into a plethora of house races, but probably about two to $3 million, I think, total, if you add up everything that was spent, more or less. And it's kind of the opening gambit in the dark money fight you're talking about. Well, yeah, to some extent here, and, and what we didn't touch on is, you know, Joe Strauss spent $3.7 million, more money than he's ever had to spend again. $307 per vote, the bounce per ounce. Right, exactly. Consider that the third most powerful politician in the state goes back to his home district in, in a wealthy part of San Antonio and has to spend nearly $4 million bucks. It's astronomical amount of money. You could run a state Senate campaign for that. His lieutenants underneath him though, and this is all a product of the question of how much is being spent on the other side, it ramps up spending by the incumbents. Byron Cook, who runs a state affairs committee, Charlie Guerin, who's another top lieutenant, for the first time in their careers, they spent more than a million dollars. Doug Miller, who's a former mayor of New Braunfels, spent close to a million dollars, is gonna get right up to a million dollars and got yoked into a runoff. So all that uh, money you see spending from the Empowered Texans, the Homeschool Coalition, Texas Right to Life, it has ramped things up in the Texas House to a whole new level in terms of money on both sides of the equation. That's good. What else? Go on over here. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, hey, Bat. Our Department of Government here. Uh, one thing that um, I've noticed that the presidents is very important how they are as administrators, how they are handling their staff, how they are you know, confronted with you know, new information, do they adjust their priors, and so how they are, how good they are at delegating. My question for those of you who work for the, the national candidates, to what extent do you see them as sort of able administrators? Uh, and Anthony, you mentioned a little bit of that about uh, the, 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 the uh, maybe a little bit more on, on the Democrat and uh, Republican campaign. Well, here, you know, trying to get a hold of the Trump campaign here, they had a guy who I, you know, was supposed to have lunch with him before I had lunch with him, he was gone. But then they had, this, this person who you would send an email to saying, can we talk? And it was like as if I had sent something to Cox Enterprises saying, I need to fix printer three, because it would come back saying, here's your ticket for your request, see Hope Hicks. Well, Hope Hicks is the, you know, the, he, she's part of the staff of five people who run the Trump campaign. She's the national spokes, I, not the spokesperson, but the communications director. I mean, the idea that, that you're trying to get information in Texas and you're told to go to one of five people in, in uh, New York who run the campaign. So I have no idea. I mean, he, you know, Steve Munisteri said, the former Republican Party chairman here, said he didn't, he didn't do any polling. He didn't um, do any of this sort of, uh, you know, complicated analytics. His biggest expenditure was on hats. <laughs> and it was, he spent, he spent near, near nothing on this campaign. So. That's either genius or it's it's a problem. I'm not sure which it is, though. And the hats are generating revenue. Oh, the hats are yeah. Yeah, they're a money maker. He he um, patented or whatever trademarked "Make America Great" the day after the last election, four years ago. It's pretty good thinking. Yeah. How about the Clinton? You were you were kind of yeah. talking about that with the Clinton uh, campaign. I mean, the Clinton campaign is a well-oiled machine. It it's pretty amazing. Um, they have a someone on on the state side that's very responsive. They have a regional director who does a handful of states, including Texas, very responsive. Um, you know, they're, they're not always going to talk on the record, et cetera. That happens all the time. But, you know, you give them a call, they call you right back, they pick up their phones. Um, the Sanders campaign um, had, had, hire, had hired a guy who actually works here um, as chief of staff and, uh, for a state legislator. A uh, really guy that knows Texas well, a, a Latino, knows Latino voter base well. Um, but, you know, I think it came down to numbers. They, I think they had a pretty small staff. Um, they, they did their best, I think, from their perspective um, in reaching out. But it was, it was difficult to get things from them on time. You know, they'd say, oh, well, we're, we're going to send you a list of endorsements, um, you know, by the end of the day. 
rarely got even a communication back for them, had to check back. But I think that was just, you know, Clinton has surrogates in every pocket of every state now. I mean, she has so many people that are willing to be on the ground for her. And, and you know, Bernie's from far away. You know, he wasn't down here in 1972 signing up Latino voters in right. San Antonio. I mean, she just, she's she's been around. And so it's really hard to beat that. And, you know, with a team that is based in Texas that knows Texas but doesn't know how to run a national campaign, it might be more difficult. But. So are you saying the Hillary Clinton campaign had a very good email operation? Super, super email operation. <laughs> what else? Yes, sir. Um, I'm Naaman Siddiqui, working in the Capitol. Um, I've heard a lot from the media that says why Donald Trump won't be a good president and won't make a good case for why he wouldn't make America great again. Well, the, you know, the case for Donald Trump, you know, the one of the interesting things in the Rob Morrow deal uh, here in Austin is you've got the Republican establishment, such as it is, you know, the people in suits saying, you know, this is a mistake, we have to undo it. And eventually they have to do it, they have to figure out how to do this in a way that's not offensive to the voters who elected him. The same thing's happening at the national level. And one of the reasons the moral story is interesting is because it's like the national thing in microcosm. Mm -hmm. If you are Mitch McConnell and you're saying, we can't have Donald Trump, or you're Mitt Romney and you're saying we can't have Donald Trump, you're speaking against your voters right now. And it, eventually at some point, you have to look up and say, you know, I'm with my voters. In 2010, everybody was against the Tea Party until they got smacked. I, you know, I, yeah. Donald, Donald Trump's doing pretty well in terms of delegates and in terms of campaigning. And, you know, somebody did a piece the other day, I can't remember who it was, was national, that was basically, he's where Romney was four years ago. He's on track to do this thing. That's the message that's working. They didn't want the governors. They didn't want senators, or well, they don't seem to yet. You know, the last two senators are still in there. Um, at some point, you have to look at this and stop saying, this is what I expect or this is what I want to happen and start saying, what's actually happening with this thing, this organic thing is Donald Trump. He's better at this than some people think he is. I know, he's, I, he's a genius. I mean, I think he's, he's arguably more electable than Ted Cruz. I think he is more electable than Ted Cruz. Right. He's also more, self-destructible so you could end up with a total you know he I, to me he could wake up one day and say I don't really want to do this anymore and just walk away and people say what happened but he but he upsets everything he'd be competitive in Pennsylvania and Ohio there'd be it'd be a 50 state map every every kind of assumption about where you know what's a Republican state and what's a Democratic state would be gone because he would he'd be terrific in you know wherever there are as he said poorly educated people I mean his there, he'll, he'll, you know, he and his and his constituency cuts across every every demographic line. I mean, he won some border in, counties here. Right, he did. He won Laredo, right? Did he right. Yeah. You don't luck in. You don't luck into Chris Christie and Jeff Sessions. You have to be on the phone. You have to be working that. There has to be a business transaction going on behind the thing. And the way those were timed, the Chris Christie thing was timed Brilliant. so that it cut off this little bit of uh, this little boomlet that Marco Rubio had. It was beautiful. And then they pop in the Sessions thing. It's like, you know, he's been talking to those guys for a couple of weeks. That didn't just happen. There's something underlying this. It's not all an existential adventure of Donald mm -hmm. Trump. There's, you know, there's, there's actually a campaign here. Look, when, but, he, when, he, when he opens his mouth, the words that come out often, you know, you watch the debates and it's like, what is he talking about? I mean, <laughs> rambling just for a minute. That, that press conference he did after Romney was just like, he it's was, still going he was on talking bit, about yeah. using marble instead of terraza and how, why they were under budget. It was just crazy. But, <laughs> but when you look at um, the, how he approaches his policies, whatever policies he has put out there so far, the one thing that I do see him doing differently is this whole flexibility idea, right? I'm flexible, I'm flexible. Well, last night you even saw in the debate when they were like, why have you changed your, your stance on immigration and, and, and bringing in uh, high-skilled laborers? And he said, well, I'm, I'm changing on that. I'm changing. I think maybe this is a better thing. And, you know, that, that's, one, that's one factor that I think, you know, other than all the other things, sets him apart from some of the other Republicans is, is the idea that he, he might say one thing and six months later... He might be like, oh, well, I'm going to do that instead. Or his, his ideas evolve maybe a little bit more publicly. I think um, evolution does go in a certain direction. But, but <laughs> among the most politically incorrect things he's done is, is say what good work Planned Parenthood does. I mean, that's something right. that a Republican candidate for president, no other Republican would dare say that. Mm -hmm. And he keeps saying it. It was like the 12th public suicide attempt. By no, I mean, Trump. he <laughs> just keeps saying it. He keeps saying it. And he obviously, you know, so it's not as if he even... 
I mean, it's just surprising, but it's just, it, you look at the constituency and there are a lot of people who are, don't want Muslims in America and want to have a right to abortions. I mean, it's not like, I think Ted Cruz, you think everybody has to be, you know, you have to, you have to want all 14 of these things or you're not a real conservative. Yeah. And Trump realizes that's not the case. People yeah. are all over the place. Ted they don't Cruz care. Ted Cruz has been the same guy since college, same guy since high school. You know, he's had the same policy stances. And, you know, and when you look at Trump's, it's like, Things are changing every day, so yeah, yeah, yeah. for good or w for better or worse, you know. Like when I when I listen to a Trump speech on any given day, to me, I just think in my mind like this is like the best version of freestyle rap possible. Like this guy is just up there, like just right off the dome, just naturally whatever comes to mind, and somehow the crowd is just eating it up. Like yeah, like Eight Mile. And this so, is gonna, this is going to be on YouTube by itself. Well, yeah, this is right? the next Donald Trump hat right off the dome. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but but I mean to go back to your question, it's like okay, you, you ask a group of reporters what might make him a good president, and I think the, if you sum down the answer, it's like there's some sense of business acumen, and he's a magnanimous guy. But if you if you look at policy, like his policy towards the press is really kind of scary. Um, um, yeah, but the whole deal of killing the terrorist terrorist for that. <laughs> the whole deal of killing terrorist families is something that the highest level of the intelligence community has said will not happen. So, um, just a starting point. Because <laughs> like you can be flexible on that. You, you get flexible, flexible that. about it. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I, you know, the argument that he's going to be a great president uh, probably is not found in policy arguments for the most part. You know, I, th I just think as I, as I listen to that, you guys all run through that and everybody jump in. It's pretty striking how nobody really knows how to make sense of this. I mean, in some ways, you know, Jonathan, you're, you're, you came the closest by going, well, could be like a really rational thing, or it could be completely nuts. He could just quit tomorrow, and I think nobody's really come to terms with what this guy is about at all. Sometimes when he, when the most virulent things come out of his mouth, you know, those shocking things that you're, you're just thinking, "Oh my lord, did he just say that publicly?" Um, there's two ways to think about it, right? He, whatever comes out of his mouth, he fully 100% believes in, and it's true to his, you know, his belief system. And the other option is, this is all just a game. No, it's, you know, it's, it's, this is all that he thinks it's funny. He knows this will play. He doesn't really care what he says. Whatever he says, he knows he's going to get big applause. Which is better, that he actually believes what he's saying or that he doesn't believe it at all? That's up to you. But, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to know where he falls on that. He's, he's in the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. Right. And I think... The thing that keeps coming back, it's Kafeyab, I think, is it where everybody's, you, you play your part, everybody knows that it's over the top, you're kind of winking at the audience, but everyone wants, but the idea is you never go out of character because you're a character. And I think that, you know, people look at him and I think he looks at himself as a character. So it's, it's different rules for him. You know, that's the problem that Hillary Clinton will have in a debate. He has his own rules. She'd have to respond under normal rules. And it's it's not fair, but that's his, it's a distinct advantage for well, him. Well, he's, he's a real, I mean, he's a really fascinating combination of completely unorthodox and unfamiliar in terms that we've seen before. But somebody who seems to have a deep, intuitive understanding mm -hmm. of how to be a candidate yeah. in this moment. Yeah, I right. think the way he sort of upended the playbook um, and has outsmarted every political consultant, possibly on the other thing, it's such a phenomenon. It's such a fascinating thing to watch, and 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 again. Every media pundit, every reporter probably up here six or eight months ago would have said that, that Trump train's going to run out of steam. Well, that was the first suicide yeah. attempt. He said he, this. He said this about Jonathan Cain. Right. Any of the things he's done, any of these sort of, you know, successive bloopers would have killed any of the other candidates. He's like the Teflon Don and, of presidential candidates. It's candidate. like a self-inoculating thing. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, you can say that. Yeah, yeah I mean, he'll I, do that. I think he's upended the rule book in a way, but it's, um, it's, not, that he, it's not that he's ignored it. It's that he, he really understands it. Yeah much more deeply than I think anybody gave him credit for going in. Yeah, this how, isn't a goof. How about another question from the audience? Oh, young lady. Hi, Elise Avina, uh, rhetoric student here at UT. Uh, this question is open to everyone. On the Democratic referendum ballot, there was an agenda item to allow public universities to opt out of campus carry. Uh, in the Texas political climate, do you think that the Democrats might gain traction for that item? I guess this is me, right? <laughs> uh, in my previous job, I, I covered gun policy issues here in Texas, and, and um, David also covered the, the campus carry debate um, in the House. And look, um, that, that was a local uh, item on, on the Travis County ballot. Those, those pr propositions that you vote for are kind of meant to gauge how much support certain 
issues have among the, the electorate, but it's it's the base, right? They're they're polling Democrats. That wasn't on the Republican ballot. So I mean, I think that if anything happens with campus carry next session, I would guess that it would be going in the opposite direction. Um, there are lawmakers who are incredibly angered by the idea that there might not be guns in dorms at UT. Right. Um, and some of those Republican lawmakers are threatening to, to, to dismantle that legislation and, and refile it so that it's much stricter and gives much less uh, leeway to campus presidents. I think if anything, if anything at all happens, you know, it's going to be going in that direction rather than um, in the opposite, especially with Trey Martinez Fisher, who was, you know, has lost his election. He was the biggest, most vocal opponent in the House um, uh, for campus carry, and he's he's not going to be there next session. So that's that's my guess. I think the reality is the gun laws are here to stay until possibly one day Democrats take control again in the distant future. But for so long as the Republicans control the legislature, the gun laws in place will, will be as they are, if not expanded. Uh, open carry at some point in time next session, I imagine, will be tweaked to clarify a lot of the confusion. Campus carry possibly broadened. But if you are against the gun laws that are in place right now, tough luck, because I think they're around the state for quite some time. Public opinion is pretty clear on this. Unless you get something that changes public opinion, you know, politicians, even if you hate them, are really, really responsive. And if you change public opinion, they'll change their minds. But, you know, you'd have to do quite something to change public opinion. Look at all the things that have happened that haven't changed it. One more? Yeah, right here. I'm Luke from uh, the Gov class. And, uh, if Trump does win the primary, how do you think he'd continue changing his views? You're asking, you're asking us to uh, anticipate <laughs> yes, what please. Donald Trump let's does. All get, let's all get in the mind of Donald Trump. <laughs> no, I think you'll, you'll continue to see a lot of the same pattern, but I think one of the things that you, you know, going along with the line that he is shrewder as a candidate right. than he's probably given credit for at times, you'll probably see him looking a bit more conventional in some of his, his policy positions. And well, I think, I, I think, you know, I mean, it's reasonable to think, you know, we're, we've kind of sat around Jonathan's a lot point. wondering what, you know, how is he getting evangelical votes or how is he getting these hardcore Republican votes? I think at some point we're going to be wondering how is he getting those Democratic votes? Mm. He's not going to be getting a lot of them. He's not beating Ted Cruz with evangelicals, but he's put a dent in him. And I think, you know, he might be appealing. He had, He looks to have the ability to appeal to groups that aren't, naturally with him that you wouldn't think would naturally be there. And I think, you know, that's particularly dangerous for Clinton with independents and, and squishy Democrats. Clinton's already shifting her messaging or she's assuming that Trump is going to be the guy that she's going to have to face. And I think a debate between the two of them, it's going to be really telling. I mean, Clinton doesn't take any crap from anyone either. I mean, she's she's got a backbone. So whether she's going to try to play outside of the normal playbook and get down in the mud with him if that's where he stays. I think that would be really interesting because I don't know if she would, you know, she would be able to do it the way that the Republic, other Republican guys going for the nomination are doing it now. I mean, trying to be the be the parent in the room, you know, be the adult. Uh, but she, she would, she would, you know, the Democrats would, it would be the status quo. She would represent no change. She would represent, you're not really that angry. Um, she would represent things are okay, you know, even her, her theme is, you America know, already is great. Already is yeah. great. We just need some more love and kindness and, yeah. and to be whole. Mm -hmm. That's a really long which, hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's just, it runs counter to, it's not picking up on, on either the Trump or the Sanders sense of discontent. And that's, you know, so it's not unusual for a year, you know, 68 was uh, tumult and change and ended up with. Richard Nixon. So it's it's not as if what you think is going to happen is going to be represented in who's president, but Trump would be on the side of of anyone who's not really happy with the way things are. Well, and in our polling, at least in Texas, we saw that for all the talk of shaking things up and unconventional, you know, discontent with politics, there's a lot of people out there that are still playing team ball here. They want their party to win. And I think, you know, that that will have a, a powerful grounding force in some of this. But, I, you know, what what a Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton debate looks like, I can't even begin to think about it. This Proof point. that God loves journalists. <laughs> well, I think the jury may still be out. 
Okay, I want to thank everybody for coming. Once again, David Rao from the San Antonio Express News, Lauren McGahee from the Dallas Morning News, Ross Ramsey, my friend from the Texas Tribune, Jonathan Tylub of the Austin American Statesman. Read them. This is just the tip of the iceberg. They're all terrific. Uh, and thanks for coming. And thank you, guys.